Over a 21-year career with the Baltimore Orioles, my guest tonight earned his title, the Iron Man. Calvin Edwin Ripken took the field on May 30th, 1982, and didn't come off for over 16 years. He would collect over 3,000 hits, win two MVP awards and a World Series title, playing in 2,632 consecutive games, the most of any player in the history of Major League Baseball. But before he became a 19-time All-Star, did you know he was a standout soccer player as a kid? Originally caught the eye of baseball scouts as a pitcher, worked part-time as a substitute teacher early in his pro career. Well, tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, as long as I can compete, I won't quit. Please welcome Hall of Famer, Cal Ripken. Thank you, man. How are you doing? Good. That's all for you. There, were, there are no applause signs in this entire place. They just wanted to get up for you. Thank you. I, I, I hope the expectation isn't for me to take a lap around this room. Yeah. <laughs> He's known for his, uh, his emotional laps. I, I, I do want to ask you, though, I, do you get the sense when you go around, before we go back in time and where you started and your family growing up, that people maybe now more than ever, appreciate the way you played the game and how you acted as a pro more than maybe some of the guys they're watching on fields or courts or slabs of ice today. Do you still get people saying that to you? Um, yeah, people come up to me all the time, and sometimes they get emotional of what, uh, what I meant to, uh, to their particular life or the relationship between their dad and themselves um, come to the ball game. Um, I get the feeling that parents brainwash some of their kids by pointing at me sometimes right. and saying, you know, um, he's the best player. Um, not necessarily because I was the best player, but uh, because they liked how I handled myself uh, on the field and off the field, which uh, provided good examples for some of those guys. So it can get pretty emotional, but uh, I don't know how they feel about today's players, but uh, I know that everybody related to showing up and, uh, and trying to do the best job they could each and every day. And then when tomorrow comes, you do the same thing again. I think everybody can relate to that. Born in 1960 in Havre de Grace, Maryland, uh, second of four. You have an older sister and then two younger brothers. I, and born into this family that I want you to explain, but somebody who grew up with a dad who was in this game, who learned from one of the greatest teachers the sport has ever had. Yeah, I mean, Dad, my first 14 years of my life, Dad was a minor league manager. Um, his dream of being a big league player uh, ended when he uh, got two foul balls hit off his right arm. Uh, he was a catcher, and his arm just kind of went dead. He couldn't uh, throw. He was faced as a 23 or a 24-year-old with a family already. Um, uh, um, what do I do for a job? And they offered him a player manager's job. And so... Um, he started uh, helping other people get to the big leagues as opposed to fulfilling his dream. And that became his whole, his whole, uh, his whole life. And so the first 14 years of my life, I was in these minor league environments watching dad be the dad for many of the players on the team and also be their coach and not to only be their hitting coach, but their pitching coach, their infield coach. He was the coach of all the things that uh, they had because they didn't have specialty coaches then. What was he like to you as a father, though, away from the ballpark when you, when you were alone with him or with your sister and brothers? Well, he was, uh, I mean, he's been referred to as a drill sergeant of, of sorts. Um, sort of, sort of disciplined, uh, sort of dry. Um, I remember uh, us kids; we were competing for his time because uh, baseball took his time away from us. I remember us looking at each other as a kid and saying, "You know, uh, um, if Dad invites, invites us someplace, you know, um, I know that sh my sister's going to say no, my brother's going to say no. I'm going to say yes, even though I didn't want to go, but I would go with my dad just to spend time, you know, with my dad." But uh, he was very. Um, straightforward, uh, you know, he was a loving dad, didn't say I loved you, uh, you know, um, at all, but, uh, at all, not growing up. 
I think it's an understatement to say he was a tough guy. Forget how he was as a father or a baseball coach or a player, whatever. This guy defined the word tough. I talked to your brother, Billy. He told me a couple of stories, one of which was when he would get a bruise on his toenail. Dad was tough. And uh, sometimes he would get his foot stepped on and a bruise would develop under the uh, nail. And so there's pressure in there. And, it, uh, and if you go to the doctors, they would stick a hot needle through the, uh, through the toenail and then relieve the pressure by having the blood come out. But dad didn't want to waste time going to the hospital. So he, he would go in the garage, take out an electric drill, put a drill bit in and drill himself. Uh, and the pressure would come off. But I was sitting there watching. I said, dad, you can't stop the drill from going into your toe. Um, but he didn't seem to worry about that. He was just uh, single-minded. Um, so he, he probably should have been a hockey player or someone that stitches himself up all the time. But those were the kind of things that dad did pretty regularly. Your mom, Violet, though, was a strong woman. For and, sure. and, and you were lucky to have this woman as your mom. Mom had uh, uh, four of us kids. And when school was out, we would get into a, uh, a station wagon, put a big red trailer up, and my mom would drive us across country to wherever dad was managing. And many times the car would break down, but she had the responsibility for all of us kids to be the dad and the mom. And, uh, and so uh, sometimes uh, I wonder how she did it, but she, uh, she always did it. Um, and she was always there. Um, like most people think dad taught me how to play baseball, but it was mom. Uh, she was there to put your arm around you when you had a bad game, and that didn't happen too often when I was a kid. Um, but she was also there to celebrate your, your successes and kind of keep you going in a positive way. So um, I kind of felt a little uh, shortchanged a little bit because all the other dads were there with their, with their, uh, with their sons. And, uh, but then I always felt that my mom knew more than the other dads. So <laughs> I, I was lucky in that way. Yeah, it's, it's your mom who's really teaching you the ins and outs. But at some point, you're around dad in these minor league facilities, and, and it became kind of like a family affair in the summer, didn't it? Well, it probably was an advantage that I didn't know at the time. Uh, many people that get drafted and go in the minor leagues, it's their first time away from home. Uh, they got to get used to the environment. They don't really know what to do. I was comfortable uh, in a minor league town or a town that was there. It was uh, what I was familiar with, so I wasn't intimidated by that. It was just trying to figure out, well, there's me right there. <laughs> this is before you were drafted by the Orioles. No, that was my, that was my first year in pro ball. Yeah. <laughs> was baseball something that you loved, or was baseball a chance for you to have time with your dad? In the very beginning, it was uh, have time with your dad. And, uh, but then really quickly, when you start being, being around it, and uh, dad's rule was, in order to be on the field, you had to have a uniform on. And so... Uh, he made me a little uniform, and uh, probably the first time I was on the field, um, kind of unsupervised when I was about eight. And I remember uh, going out there, and he would say, go out to the outfield and shag balls. Don't try to catch them. When they hit the fence, go over and pick them up and throw them in. And then that graduated to trying to catch the balls. And then all the, all the other um, players on the team, you know, when dad wasn't looking, they'd tell me to go catch it or go, or go try this, go try that. You took advantage of those opportunities. I had a chance to go to the ballpark, um, had the encyclopedia of baseball as a dad, and I also had many different volumes of books in the form of players that I could ask questions to them all day. I pestered them, I asked them questions all the time. Uh, it was really interesting, I had a little system. If I went and talked to a player and they gave me some advice that uh, I thought was iffy, yeah, I'd go back to my dad uh, in the, uh, in the, his little manager's office after the game was over, and I'd say, Dad, I was talking to so-and-so today, and he said I should catch a fly ball with one hand over here like this. And then my dad would look at me and go, and I'd go, is that right, Dad? And he goes, no, that's not right. So then I would X him off my list. <laughs> and then your dad would cut him. Uh, well, I don't know about <laughs> I don't remember what happened there, but, uh, but, but when I talked to Doug DeSensei, who was one that was really took a special interest in me and gave me uh, some pointers on how to field a ground ball, played pepper with me, played catch with me, he just, he just played, played with me. And so I always liked him, and he always gave really good fundamental advice. I'd go back and tell Dad, and Dad would say, yes, that's exactly right. So then I'd search Doug out, you know, as soon as I could the next day. So he, he, did, uh, he did take care of me. Uh, and looked out for me. So those players, uh, I had a system in which I could grab information from, um, but I always checked it against my dad. Dad, is this right? And he'd say, that's right. And then I would, I would uh, use him. I, I find it 
great that at 12 years old, you know you want to play pro ball. But it's a little more realistic for you, isn't it? I would have guessed, uh, some people ask me, when is the first time that you knew that you wanted to play pro ball? And I tried to think back on where my dad was managing, where I was. I was the bat boy in, in Asheville, North Carolina. And I think I was 10. And I kept, and I think the dream at that time, even though I, I was exposed to a little big league baseball, but minor league baseball was right in front of me. I thought they had the best jobs, that they got to play a game all the time and they got paid for it. Now, I didn't know they didn't get paid that well, but they got paid for it uh, at the same time. So I think my first dream was to be what they were, uh, minor league players. I thought that was the coolest thing. I know your, your siblings have said that you were, you were tough. I mean, you were kind of, even to play Monopoly. What, what did my brothers and sisters Well, say? Billy, I only talked to <laughs> Billy. But, I mean, you were kind of a stat keeper back then and, and somebody, you know, who would keep track of wins and losses on a board game or whatever it may be. Is that? No, I mean, I was, uh, I was competitive. I wanted to win at everything I played, you know, and whether it was cards, ping pong, darts, um, you name it. And once you started to, to play, and you, you had to convince other people to play with you. And your, my behavior was pretty bad. I mean, uh, I wanted to keep stats uh, so you can go back and see how many times I beat you or how many times I skunked you, how many times I did this and that. So I was rubbing it in. And then nobody wanted to play with me after a while. <laughs> um, but it was uh, um, just the way I was intoxicated with uh, that sort of winning and that sort of feeling. Uh, that obviously comes directly from your dad, mm -hmm. I would think. Is it fair to say that as you get into your high school years, I, I know you made the varsity team, but, but you had a lot of growing to do, even for you. Yeah, I was 5'7", 128 as a freshman. And I knew that uh, I didn't, I didn't I didn't tear up the league. It, it almost took me a whole season to get a hit. But I was sacrifice bunting a lot. I was hitting bottom of the order. Um, and uh, um, I got a few hits, and I started to, started to figure it out towards the end. But I think I hit a buck 28 for my uh, freshman year. You were as good a pitcher as a high schooler as you were an infielder. Right? Yeah, I got, I got way more attention as a pitcher. So as uh, if I go back, 5'7", 128 turned into be a, a little bit bigger. I don't remember what I was as a sophomore, but I got a little success as a sophomore. But as a junior year, they let me pitch. And uh, I threw the ball, I had a really good arm, and uh, I was, I was uh, throwing as hard as, uh, as anybody around. I had a really good breaking ball and a good changeup. And uh, I was striking out two guys an inning, you know, and every time the scouts came to watch me play, um, they graded me on being a pitcher because they saw me pitch and I was, uh, I was pretty dominating as a pitcher. And the Orioles were the only team that actually um, saw me and knew me enough to, to uh, be interested in me as a regular player. And it really was interesting. Ultimately, I had a choice when I got drafted by the Orioles in the second round. They didn't, I don't think they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, many people in the organization wanted me to pitch. Um, and a uh, few in the organization, including the scout that followed me around, thought I had a chance to be a uh, good infielder. And uh, Hank Peters ultimately came down um, and, and put, the, put the question to me, um, what do you want to do? And uh, I said, well, pitchers get to play one out of every five days. I want to play every day. And so I chose to be a shortstop. Um, my dad was pretty diplomatic during that time frame. He said, in all my years of developing kids in the minor leagues, when we had a situation like this, it's, it's, uh, if you start him out as a regular player, he continues to hit. And so if it doesn't work out as a regular player, you can always go back to pitching. But, but it's very difficult to go from, you be a pitcher first, and then say, okay, now we're going to try you as a regular player. It's so, funny how that works. It's true. I mean, only a few guys have been able to, to make that transition. Um, 1978, you get drafted. Their third pick, but still in the second round. And now your dad's working for the Orioles and a part of that organization from 1957 forward. And here you are as a second round pick by of all teams, the Baltimore Orioles. I, was, I felt really good, um, but um, there was a part of me too that, um, um, that uh, didn't want to be judged or, or, or didn't want to be felt like uh, my dad had, uh, had influenced the decision or. I think that's only natural, don't you, as you look back? Yeah, and then, but I was really happy and proud to, uh, to, because the Orioles were, you know, my dad's love and we were, we grew up around, uh, around Baltimore, so. Your pro career starts and you are asked 
what do you want to be? The answer is position player, but it wasn't shortstop. There was a lot of third base when you finally got the opportunity, and, and we'll get to all the shortstops. So, so have you had Derek Jeter sit in this chair yet? Yes. You have? Yes. Did he tell you about how many errors he made in rookie ball? Uh, yeah. I probably made more than he did. Yes. I think I made 30, 32 errors in 64 games. And uh, so when I said I wanted to be a shortstop and play there, you know, uh, they let me do it. But, I, but all the Orioles brass, I kept looking at, they kept looking at me and said, I, I told you you should have been a pitcher. I told you you should have been a pitcher. Just for us, you know, you're going through this. I know you had a college scholarship put into your deal that you signed just in case. You don't know, you know you're not 100% in on the infield. You want to do it, but you're making 30-plus errors. Are you thinking maybe I'm not right for this? <laughs> maybe it's too big for me? You know, a couple of the players that uh, when they go back and look at it, when, when it's all over, they said that I was uh, calling home all the time and I was crying that I couldn't do it. Is that That's not um, true. That's not true. Um, but, uh, but I was doubting whether I could play or not. I mean, you're a big fish in a small pond in, when you're in high school, and then you go to pro ball, and you got all these guys around that are as good as you or better. At some point, your dad's telling you to keep stats. I mean, you were, you were diligent about pitchers you were facing, how guys were working you. I mean, that, that was something that was – I mean, I know a lot of guys do that now, certainly later in your mm -hmm. career, but – you were one of the first guys to do that. Well, I mean, I had a good system. I just kept track of what you did to me. So if you struck me out the first time up and you got me out on a breaking ball, I would make a note that you got me out on a breaking ball. So the next time I faced you, I would refer to my own notes, and it would help me, you know, um, understand what you were trying to do to me. And so then you would make adjustments. So that was a little different because most people didn't take those sort of notes, but Dad encouraged me to do that. And once the experience took hold, then the information was really valuable to me. I could apply it. I could start to put it to use. You're also getting a little more time at third base. Quite frankly, third was way easier at that point because at shortstop for me, the speed of the game, the runners and the timing and all that kind of stuff, uh, all of a sudden I'm going for high school where you don't get that much pressure going down the line. All of a sudden you, you get a lot of pressure from guys running down the line and they're really fast. And I couldn't get my footwork right. I couldn't get my timing right you know it was just like I just couldn't I was I couldn't do it so when you go to third third is more a position when the ball's hit to you you catch it and then you throw shortstop you have to set up catch it then throw um, so um, it made it much more elementary I could catch the ball pretty good and if you gave me enough time I could get over and throw the ball pretty good so then I started uh, playing really well at third and they go you're way more suited to play third so I stayed at third for the rest of the a ball season Double A my next year, then Triple A, um, and it wasn't until I got to the big leagues that uh, Earl Weaver decided, you know, at, um, out of the blue to try me at short again. Okay, so you get called up and you get a taste of it in 1981. You've been around it, you know what that world is like, but now it's you. Now you're not just a pro; you're a big leaguer. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you stepping into that clubhouse the first time when when now? Now it's, it's on Cal Ripken Jr. I was intimidated by the environment. Even you with all the experience being around clubhouses? Well, clubhouses were the minor league clubhouses, small stadiums, you know, not really much experience in big stadiums. And all of a sudden there was the media component that everything you did, you know, um, you were scrutinized. Um, and uh, the stadiums, when I made my debut as a pinch runner and uh, Ken Singleton had got on in the extra inning, he was on second base. And uh, Earl Weaver told me to go run for Ken Singleton. And so I'm starting to run out. And Ken's looking at me because I wasn't known for my speed. And neither was Ken Singleton. <laughs> and so he goes, he goes, you're pinch running for me? And I go, yeah. Um, and I went out there and uh, uh, took a lead. Frank White was the second baseman. And very first play, he puts a pickoff play on second base. And so he, he turns around, catches the ball, and tags me on the leg. I was already safe. And he looks at me and he goes, just checking, kid. And he went back to his position. How about that? Welcome to the big leagues. We're going to try and pick you off second base, you and, pinch runner, and you. I'm, and I'm sure he could tell that I was nervous. The reason I, I remember that is I ran out in the field from the dugout. And that was the first time that I was on a, a stadium field. The lights were there. It felt like you were center stage. And, uh, and I hadn't had that experience before. All of a sudden, you look around. You've run the bases before, and you know what a secondary lead is. You know what a primary lead is. You know how to cut third base. You know the outs and all that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, you're out there in the center of stage, and it was different. And uh, I end up scoring the winning run on a base hit down the right field line. 
Um, but I, I, can't, I can't forget, it was just this uh, different place that you were playing baseball that I'd never played before. So getting used to that sort of feeling um, um, took me a little while. So 1982, at some point early, Earl Weaver, who is this great champion of your cause, says this kid can play shortstop and he can play shortstop every day. And I mean, you're a big guy. You know, now- A little we're, bigger now than I was. Yeah, but, but now we're, we're in an era where there are big shortstops, but you were the first guy. I mean, Earl Weaver said, I've been here a long time. They can fire me. This kid's gonna play shortstop. You had a guy in your corner mm -hmm. that, that was there banging the drum for you. That had to be an incredible lift for you. I came in one day, looked at the lineup card, and normally at that time, five was next to my na uh, name to represent third base. And this time there was a six. So I thought maybe he just made a mistake. He put the wrong number next to my name. And uh, so then Len Sakata, who was, had been playing short, came up and said, no, that's not a mistake. You're playing short tonight. And then Earl did call me into the office, and he gave me this really elementary speech. He said, uh, he says, yeah, you're going to play short tonight. And he said, if the ball's hit to you, I want you to catch it. <laughs> and they said, Thanks, Earl. he goes, after you catch it, I want you to get a good grip on it, and I want you to make a good throw to first base. If he beats it out to first base, he's on first. He's not on second. And I was like thinking, what are you talking about? Right. And, and what he was trying to say was don't try to do too much. You don't try to do more than you're, you're capable of. Just catch it and make a normal throw over to first base. But by the time I went back to short now, that timing thing that I had pr problems with in the minor leagues was all worked out. Um, I had a good sense of uh, speed and how fast it was. And I could set up and I could do all that kind of stuff. But it was presented as a temporary move. It wasn't presented that Cal's going to play, be the shortstop for the next 15 years. But he believed in you. So in 1982, you win Rookie of the Year. You're fulfilling the dream that your dad wanted for himself but was injured and couldn't fulfill. You know, um, one of the big things is I wanted to make him proud of me. You know, I think most sons want to make uh, their dads proud of them. And in my particular case, um, it was what his dream was, and he didn't get a chance to do that, so I was kind of doing it for him. With your father, when you were drafted by the Orioles, when you came up with the Orioles, when you were getting established with the Orioles, he's there. Did you get any moment between the two of you where he said, son, I'm proud of you? You know, um, probably not. <laughs> um, and... Uh, but my first big league home run on opening day, 1982, the first person I shook hands with was my dad, who was the third base coach. And I could tell every single time I had a home run or did anything like that, when, or when he shook your hand, you know, he would say some little thing or he'd tap you on the butt that was different than he did for everybody else. So, I mean, it was his way of, you know, there was more pride in it. There was, there was a happiness that, uh, that he gave me in that sort of interaction that, you know, he would, he, would, he would act like it was the same for everybody else, but it wasn't. 82 ends, you get the Rookie of the Year award, but Earl Weaver retires. Was that hard to watch him walk out the door? Well, we knew it was, it was going to be a, his retirement year, and it was one of the, the most exciting years. We got off to a slow start, and um, we started to get it going, and we were chasing the Milwaukee Brewers to the, to the, to the end. And the most exciting series that I've been a part of, we had... We were three games out of first place with four games to play at home against the team that was ahead of us. And so we had a doubleheader on Friday night, and we beat Milwaukee bad. And so we beat them the first two games. We blew them out on Saturday, and now we're tied after 161. And uh, the last game comes down to Jim Palmer pitching against Don Sutton. And Robin Yount hit two home runs off of Jim Palmer and changed that whole outcome. And we end up uh, losing. And we got a chance to see Milwaukee celebrate on our field. Um, and we all looked at it. And I think we all, to a T, said, you know, we, we just needed to make up one game. Where could we have made up that one game? If we had a better record in April, if we had a better record in May, if, we'd have, if we would have won that game that we were leading by three runs. Everybody was thinking that way. And I think watching the Milwaukee Brewers celebrate, um, uh, when we went to spring training the next year, you didn't have to tell anybody. We, we were more businesslike. We got off to a faster start, and we won um, outright the pennant. But you guys win 90 games. You take on the Phillies in the World Series. What was that like going into your first World Series? 
Well, all those experiences were new, but all of a sudden now your adrenaline goes to another level. Um, and in order to compete and play in the playoffs, you have to somehow control that adrenaline. Adrenaline can be good and it can uh, be helpful to you, but if you let it go too far um, out, you start to um, feel like you can do more than you can and you play outside of what you're, you're capable of. So I had to start to control that. Did pretty well in the, uh, um, in the championship series against the White Sox. Swung the bat pretty well. When we went to the, uh, uh, the World Series, um, it just felt like another level. And uh, it was hard to control that. You felt like Superman. It just felt like you could hit a ball out of the stadium. And sometimes you, you, you wanted to do well instead of letting the game come to you. So I was, only, I was three for 18 in that series, but it was a good experience to, uh, to get in there. And the excitement level, you just learn yourself about how you, can, how you can compete and how you can perform in that. But I think because it's part of your goal um, as a kid, you want to be a big leaguer, and you're looking to uh, fulfill a dream that way. But you also want to be part of a World Series uh, champion. You want to know what that feels like. Oh, and two, the count on Maddox. A liner, and the Orioles are the world champions. So... It is interesting. A lot of people ask, you, you had a long career. You've experienced a lot of things, a lot of all-star games, playoffs, um, walk-off home runs. Uh, um, you've come, you've come, uh, come through in the clutch in front of 50,000 people. You've failed in front of 50,000 people. Um, what was the best moment for you? And that last out of the uh, World Series, it was a little humpback line, line drive from Maddox. And, uh, and the ball's coming. At first, I thought I was going to have to jump for it, but then it kind of came down, and it was just an easy catch. But when I put my glove around that ball, there was a, a feeling of satisfaction, fulfillment, um, joy that nothing else in baseball comes close to. You've gone from Rookie of the Year to American League uh, champion to world champion to MVP. I mean, this, this is coming fast and furious. This streak has begun. It wasn't looked upon as a streak. It was like your responsibility was to come pl play and put yourself in the hands of the manager. And so when I try to explain what the streak or how it happened, I mean, it never was a goal of mine to break Lou Gehrig's record. It was, you know, I'd rather have more home runs than uh, Hank Aaron. I'd, you know, I'd rather have more hits than Pete Rose. And so you're trying to do all those things, but you're coming to the ballpark with the go goal of... Uh, of uh, being an everyday player, and it was honorable to be an everyday player, and the manager chooses you each and every time. 1987, which is an incredible year and in, in this unbelievable combination of Ripkins, and a lot of guys on the team were lobbying for your dad to be the manager. Your dad was loved. You know when he gets hired that this probably is not going to have a great ending because the team's not very good. Yeah, the thing that bothered me a little bit was it looked like we were in a rebuilding situation, which would have been okay because Dad was a good teacher, a good developmental manager, and might have been the right person for that job. But we never said that we were in a rebuilding mode. It was uh, the expectation for everyone was that uh, we'd, we had won the World Series. We were pretty good in 84 and 85. Um, 86 kind of went downhill towards the end. But I think everybody said we were one or two players away. And that was the expectation. And but that, that wasn't that, realistic. That wasn't realistic. That wasn't the truth. Was it emotional? What was it like to play for your dad? I mean, that's, they're, they're, you know, that's in a new category now for you. Well, I mean, the hard part was that our team wasn't very good and we didn't, we didn't win a lot of games. But uh, um, we all thought that we were sort of rebuilding to that, to that uh, point. And there were some really good moments during the uh, year. Uh, having your dad be the manager, and uh, having your brother be the starting sec second baseman at, at the halfway point of that first year. Which is incredible. Think about that. His brother comes up uh, right around the All-Star break, at the break. Yeah, right after the break. And, and you're the double play combination Billy and Cal put out there by senior. It was interesting. Billy that year came up, and uh, he had 308, I think, for the second half. And I think there was only two other players that had more hits in that second half than Billy. I think um, it was Seitzer and Mol Molitor, I think. Um, so he played really well, um, which was great. Um, and, uh, and it was good to get to know Billy as a double play combination. You know, as brothers, we thought alike. 
Um, I knew exactly where I needed to get the ball for the toughest double play. He knew exactly where he ne I needed the ball for to turn a tough double play. So there was a there was this uh, intangible of knowing each other and communicating that was uh, that was really cool to 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 to, do, to 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 play with him each and every day. I, what was it like when your dad was fired in '88? You guys are 0-6. I mean, I he, he got such a short chance. Yeah, I found out on the radio. I mean, I came in, um, and I turned the radio on. I was coming to the ballpark, and it set, told me over the radio. So um, I, uh, it was unexpected, uh, and I wasn't sure what, what to do. Um, and I, I felt bad for him. He, had, he waited in line for an opportunity all this time. He, he put his heart and soul into um, doing whatever the organization wanted in the minor leagues. I think he was even asked to stay in the minor leagues when he had a chance to come to the big leagues for the developmental reasons, because he was good at that. And then once he got a chance to be in the big leagues, um, he wanted to, uh, to manage. And so I felt really bad for him. And in some ways, we were 0-6 when he got fired. I swear we could have been 4-2 if uh, Eddie Murray or myself would have got a hit. So you start to think, if I would have drove in that run or I would have got that win, that would have... That would have uh, that would have kept him there for a minute, but but not really in the end. Is the games streak on your radar at this point in 1987? To me, when I look at the whole streak, the whole thing about the streak, it wasn't really a story or an issue until it got close to 1,000 games. You know, like all of a sudden the National League record was there, and then people were talking about the National League record. And then, then the, uh, in between... It became sort of negative uh, in between 1,200 and 1,500 or well, 1,600. Well, pe people started saying that it was time for you to sit, get a break, build yourself back up, and come in refreshed. Did, you which, heard that stuff. Which, which people were saying that? Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> the, no, he, from, I'm not making that up. You know I'm not no, making from, that from up. No, from my perspective, um, when the team started uh, not performing well, there was finger pointing. When we went to that rebuilding and dad was fired and uh, I got finger pointed at me, a slump then, your job is still to come out and play. It's still the same thing. It's easier to play for a winner than it is for a loser any day of the week because you have to start to figure out how to modify your goals and how to keep your goals aligned. If you're playing for a winner, it's just, it, it, the easiest thing is what can I do to help us win today? And the game sort of helped dic dictates what you do. When you're not playing for a winner, you're torn between, you know, you want to get your numbers, you want to drive in runs, you know, they're trying to pitch around you, you're not letting them pitch around you. You're like, you get, your brain's kind of exploding trying to do, do the things that you normally want to do. So when I was in a slump before, it was just okay. But then all of a sudden, Cal's tired, he's selfish, he needs to take a day off, he needs to, uh, you know, step out and, and all this kind of stuff. And the answers weren't, and to me, the answer was not in sitting out. The answer was finding your swing, finding your, you know, either in a game or in the cage and, and, and working on it. So it was just persistence like, like always. So, but there were, was criticism and it was, it was, I had a bunch of critics that at the right time they would actually focus on that. And then once it got past a certain point, and I wish I could tell you what exactly it was, all those critics that were critical as could be on that all of a sudden turned positive. And they thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And they, and they thought that I had to break this for the sake of baseball. And I could never figure out how they could be critics on one moment and then, you know, uh, be an advocate for it at the second. Either you're, you're, you're in or you're out. You think it's a value or you don't think it's a value. You think it's a good thing or you don't think it's a good thing. So there was a negative period in there, which coincided with us not being very good. It was June of 1990 that you take over second place on that. Iron Man list behind the great Lou Gehrig. Um, who did I pass? Everett Scott. Everett Scott. So that was in the 1300s? 1400s. Yeah, you got about 800 games to go. I mean, you're five full years away, really. I mean, if you want to round it off <laughs> of playing every game. I mean, that was the last thing in my mind. You know, I wasn't thinking that. I was, you know, we, we were thinking about getting through the rebuilding process and getting back to being good. 1991, it's, it's an unbelievable year, and you're MVP on a bad ball club, a last-place ball club. And then in May of 93, you were hitting below 200. And from what I'm told, there was a time that it may have crossed your mind to take a seat. 
And yeah, 93 was the year we had the All-Star game in Baltimore. And I got off to a slow start. I think I was hitting less than 200 in June. Um, and I uh, just couldn't get it going. And, uh, and, and uh, I thought maybe the answer would be, you know, just sit down. So I asked Rick Sutcliffe, I said, what do you think? Um, do you think, uh, you know, um, all this other stuff would go away? It would just go back to be a simple game. You show up and you just play. You know, I don't have to worry about all the street thing. And I remember he said, uh, he goes, uh, um, well, I'm pitching tomorrow. And um, if you take a day off tomorrow, um, um, you'll have to explain it to, you know, to the media and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there'll be one thing that you hadn't thought of. And I go, what's that? And he says, he says, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and, and he said, and he went on to say it in a really nice way. He goes, he goes look, um, uh, I want, when I pitch a game, I get pitch, pitch one every five days. When I pitch, I want the best lineup I can behind me to win the ball game. And everybody else feels the same way. You're the best in the position behind me. All you have to do is go fix your hitting. And so then focusing on that and not focusing on all the other noise that was around it, said, OK. And he even said, look, he says, you think you can get a bunt base hit? And, you know, and this is from someone that doesn't bunt. And I go, yeah, I think I could. If you get a bunt base hit and you go get a hit, that's a start. And so his experience um, made sense to me. And I started working on my uh, swing. I started to get hot. Did you drop one down? Um, I had a few bunt base hits in my time. August of 94, you've now played 2,000 straight. But that was leading into something that I don't think anybody could believe was going to actually happen, and that was no postseason. People within the game, outside of the game, thought, no way. They're going to get back on the field before the postseason rolls around, and it didn't happen. Right. That was crippling to the game of baseball. Yep. But when 95 rolls around, I sense that there was a little bit on your plate of trying to bring people back to the game. Is that accurate? I, th I think. It was, it was the feel-good story. It was, hey, there's just been a work stoppage. And now, but OK, that's behind us. And we're going to celebrate the one guy that every time he shows up at the ballpark comes to play. <laughs> There, there was symbolism in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I get credit for that and uh, say that I helped save baseball and that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's a little dramatic. I, I think what happened was um, when, this, when the uh, strike happened um, and, and the, the World Series was canceled, I think all of us in baseball felt bad for that. It was like a death. Yeah, and so once we started the season and once, at the, remember spring training was uh, delayed in 1995. It was a shortened spring training. Your owner, Peter Angelo, said with an eye on the streak, if, if they force us to play games, we'll forfeit games. Yeah, so there was a replacement player issue and, uh, and whether the streak would count if, uh, if games were played with replacement players and I, w I didn't play in the game. Um, so there were a lot of cool things that happened. I mean, the Players Association said that I could cross the line to play. And it did, to me, it's all about the principle. I say, well, that, that's not why we're here. You would have here. never done that. And I said but I wouldn't do it. So once we started back in the season, once we went, went back to, uh, to work in spring training, um, the first day I went out on the field, you know, I didn't know what to expect from the media covering it at that time. And there was so many media out there that was covering it that all of a sudden you go, whoa. You know, this is the way it's going to be all year. And so I regrouped with uh, John Maroon, our uh, PR guy, and that was his first year. He started to organize, you know, that. What so, a time for him to come in. And it was, uh, and we figured it out slowly but surely because I didn't, I didn't want it to affect. But, but there was an opportunity that you saw that there was interest, and there was a lot of interest, and the fans were uh, coming out to spring training in great numbers. And as the streak was starting to be celebrated in each city, you know, every time you went into the city, there was enough media attention that you had to organize to say, okay, I can't do it all three days. Let's do it one of the days. Let's do yeah, it the very first day. there's inherent pressure in this, isn't there? I mean, did you feel that? Because physically, you know, you guys have, have not been, you know, as fortunate as, you know, people inside the game to see you guys at the end of games. You know, you're peeling these baseball pants off and there's just yeah. gashes on your legs and there, I mean, the bruises and getting hit by pitches and... One pitch to the hand the wrong way, I don't care who you are or what your work ethic is, you're not showing up the next day to be in the lineup. Yes, I guess if you put it all together that way, you could, you could come up with pressure. I didn't look at it that way. I look at it as uh, if something were to happen and it was to be over, that's how it was supposed to be. 
and you would just go out there and play. And I always felt if you played hard, you insulated yourself from, from uh, potential injury. Uh, if you played soft and you played easy and you tried not to get injured, I think that's when you put yourself in a position where you're not protected. So I always believed in that. And so I just played. And by, but reaching out to the, um, to the fans, um, I think the fans were looking for something good to cheer for in the game. That special night, September 6th of 1995, I want to play two clips. First is before the game, a special moment. In a moment, we should have the first ball ceremony. Cal's two kids, five-year-old Rachel and two-year-old Ryan, will throw out the first balls. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now it's Ryan's turn. He's more interested in the blip, I think. Let her rip, Ryan. Top ball. Well done by the Ripken kid. He clobbers it to deep left field. Go! How great is that to deliver on that night? How special to have your kids there. Yeah. How special to have that moment with them throwing out the first pitch. Well, I, I look back and I said I was lucky. Um, you, you have, who has a chance to celebrate, you know, those sorts of moments with their, uh, with their family? And so I wore a T-shirt underneath my uh, jersey that they gave me um, that morning. It said 21, uh, 30 plus kisses for daddy. And... So when I, um, during the, when the game became official, I, cha I changed my jersey, but I took it off. And the whole reason I took my jersey off was just to show them that I had the T-shirt on underneath. And so then I presented my jersey to, uh, to my kids and then went in and put another jersey on for the rest of the game. The game's not official until the fifth inning. The Orioles are running in from the bullpen to the dugout to congratulate Cal Ripken. All the relief pitchers. Everybody out of the bullpen, coming into the dugout. It is official now. Cal Ripken has broken Lou Gehrig's record. The new record set by the Orioles Iron Man, 2,131 consecutive games. One of the great moments in baseball history. The Iron Man has passed the Iron Horse. Wow. <laughs> 22, 22 minutes that ovation was for you. See, it's a long time. That is a long time. Did you have a moment after that game with, with your family, with your dad? With there was a lot of moments during that, that time. When I just looked at myself running down, I was quick in the early parts because that was the anxiety of let's get the game going again. I'm a little embarrassed that uh, we've stopped the game this long. Let's, let's go. And I remember I had a moment with my dad. My dad was up in the skybox. I don't know if you saw. So he was up in the skybox. And it was like, uh, you know, we talk about uh, um, love, ex love uh, passing through or communicating. There was a thousand words that kind of went through him and I you know, at, uh, at that moment. So that was pretty cool. During that streak, 3,713 players went to the disabled list across Major League Baseball. And as we sit here, there is nobody even close. Right. I mean, you never want to say a record is never going to be broken. But man, if there's one sitting out there that looks uncatchable, that's it. So, but, I mean, from my perspective, I was just playing. And then, yeah, a million things could go wrong. You could hit in the hand here, you could break your wrist, and, and you're out. Jack Morris hit me in the elbow in, like, the second day of the season. And right on the funny bone, and it, uh, it uh, affected the ability to feel the ball to throw it. And so uh, that came on and off during the course of the year. So, I mean, I realized there were small things that could happen or big things that could happen. They could, you could uh, miss a game. Yeah, but over the course of all these years, you had to come across guys. You'd be sitting there thinking, really? You're taking a day? Really? <laughs> it's been eight years I haven't had a Really? I, I'm, that hurts? I've I'm so sorry. I've seen a lot of things. And so... Uh, <laughs> But that, but that doesn't change how you approach your job, right? right? I get so it. So it's somebody, it's somebody else. You hold yourself to a to a standard, and a, and and that's how 
like I always thought I was doing the right thing. I always ask our guests to relate to this quote. Yours is, as long as I can compete, I won't quit. What does that quote mean to you? Um, when, when you're doing something in competition, it's not over till the final out. It's not over till it's, you know, it's to quote Yogi, it's not over till it's over. And so when you're competing, you have, a, you have hope, you have a chance, and you're, 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 you're laying on the line. So baseball is a beautiful sport that you can't run the clock out. You've got to give yourself the, your, your uh, allotted number of outs. And uh, if you keep at it, you know, there's always hope. There's some miracle things that happen where you can come from behind. Maybe that came out of the context of trying to find that one game in 1982 that we could have won the pennant if we would have found it in April or May or June. So this speaks to you more team for sure than individual. Yes. You guys got good again, though. 1996, mm -hmm. first time you make the playoffs in a long, long time since... You won it all. Mm -hmm. And that team was good. That team was a really good team. And you take on the Yankees, you get into a situation where a kid hanging over the right field fence at Yankee Stadium interferes with a ball, Jeffrey Mayer, and pulls in what should have been an out mm -hmm. as a home run. And I think it was Tony Tarasco was out there. Good memory. And he's pointing. And Richie Garcia, I think, is the umpire. Mm -hmm. If instant replay were a part of the game back then, do you win that first game against the Yankees? And who knows? Well, I know we left New York 1-1, uh, one and one, and we could have you know, been 2-0. and oh. And so if you're 2-0 and oh leaving the, uh, the road ballpark and you're going home, you feel like you got to have an advantage. So uh, I mean, it had been so long for you to taste postseason again. And now you got a really good team, and a baseball is interfered with, and it doesn't happen for you guys. You're competing. You're trying to play. You're trying to win. Um, we thought we were a better team. We were in the driver's seat. You hit 444, mm -hmm. and then you guys lose 4-1. Mm -hmm. How did you know in 98 that that was it? For the streak? Well, I think uh, I was looking at the whole situation and I was looking at it earlier in the year and I always had the uh, the approach that uh, um, you're out there to try to help win and from the very first year I had you're trying to find that one game where you didn't win so it's important to put an emphasis on each and every game and I thought to me to myself if we fall out of the race you know it'd be a good time to to end it and we fell out of the race and my first in in inclination was just to take the last day of the season off, you know, game number 162, almost, a, almost saying, well, I could have played 162 if I wanted to. But let's put, put it back, and the manager can make his choice without any sort of pressure from anything else. Everybody will, will just go back to the beginning. So the last day of the season would have been in Boston. And uh, um, I started to think about it, and uh, people close to me um, said, you know, um, you can't do it on the road. You know, everyone sees this as a as a wonderful um, attribute and a value, and you should it should be celebrated. And if it's gonna you're gonna end it, you should end it at home. So the last game of that uh, home home season was against the Yankees. Beautiful moment, September '98. Cal Ripken on the phone, presumably to the press box, and he is not in the lineup. This is just moments ago. Ray Miller exchanging lineup cards with Joe Torre out of the Yankee dugout since this is an official game it has started in as a group the Yankees left the dugout and gave Cal Ripken an ovation of their own out of respect which was a very classy maneuver and now the fans rise as one sensing what's happened when you get admiration like that From that other dugout. Yeah, it was cool. Um, I remember looking in. I remember seeing Boomer Wells. I remember seeing Derek Jeter come out first. But it didn't dawn on me until right now when we were looking at it is that they exchanged lineup cards. And so they already knew. You know, I thought that they just noticed. But uh, I'm thinking, no, they exchanged lineup cards. And uh, so Joe knew, you know, that I wasn't in a lineup. So have we ruined a great memory for you? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. But then they all got up on the top step. And then the cool part about it is the whole stadium 
it started to happen all the way around the stadium, and that was really nice. In 1999, you lose your father to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. What was it like going through that, saying that as somebody who's lost his own father? And when you think back on what that was like in 1999, right. how'd you deal? Um, it was hard losing him, but uh, I thought I lost my safety net. I thought that, um, you know, things that that uh, um, I was alone in some ways. And it turned out to be the opposite. It felt like he was with me more um, in all your decisions and all, the, all your thoughts. When you think you need him, you know, all of a sudden he's there. So um, I've heard other people s describe it that way, but it, it definitely is that way with me. So you go into the Hall of Fame, fourth most votes of all time. Your baseball's Iron Man. I want to know who didn't vote for you to go into the Hall of Fame first time through. But I mean, this you've done it all. I mean, from the Hall of Fame, from the kid who came up and the organization that he was around as a child that his dad poured his life into, to first ballot Hall of Famer, Iron Man. I mean, really, there was nothing else for you to accomplish in this game, was there? I mean, you can't look back and say, oh, if I just had a, you well, did everything. Well, I'm, I'm jealous of uh, Chipper Jones' uh, career and uh, Derek Jeter's career because they got to play uh, on a winner. You know, just think a bad year for them was losing in the first round of the playoffs. Right. I mean, 14 straight titles for... Uh, for the Atlanta Braves. Atlanta Braves. And Jeter's got a ring for every finger. And he was, in, he was there all the time, and, and he was a big part of it, you know. But to be part of a winning team, that's the only regret that you have is that you went through a rebuilding process, which, again probably was better for, for my overall life experience. But um, you want to be in the playoffs every year. I mean, when I got back in 96, you know, you're thinking, God, this is the best. You know, you get a chance to play. This is what you play the whole 162 games for is this right here, to be able to compete. Um, and you don't know who's going to win. It's who plays better and who's hotter. You know, uh, um, you can prove who, who are the better teams by a long 162-game season, but in a short series – Anything can happen, and and I thought it was a it was just a wonderful. That's um, um, what we play for. And so, if there was any regrets or if I could change anything, I'd like to be in those playoffs a whole lot more. Last question I ask is, what's next? What what are you working on? What's what's next for Cal Rivkin? Um, our foundation in Dad's name is uh, is uh, is helping a lot of kids, and we're, it's going gangbusters uh, across the country. We've built. Uh, 60 youth development parks in tough areas uh, that are essentially outdoor classrooms for, for a lot of our, our programs. Um, so we're using baseball to reach kids, um, not necessarily looking for the next big leaguer, but looking for a positive outcome and, a, and positive relationships where the kids have a chance. Great. So these are fun questions we uh -oh. end with. Oh, All I right, see. Mr. Monopoly, Mr. I keep stats to know if I'm winning at <laughs> tiddlywinks and ping pong. Would you rather have to wear a top hat or an eye patch everywhere you go? <laughs> My choice is a top hat or an... Uh, One or the other. Top hat. Not an eye patch. The mysterious Cal Rifkin. I, I want to be able to use both eyes. And why would you ever cover up a gorgeous blue <laughs> eye like that? That wasn't my answer. Okay. Would you rather watch TV with someone else controlling the remote or ride in the car with someone else always controlling the radio? I'd rather have the remote in my hand. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Is that... <laughs> Last one. Would you rather ride across the country in a kangaroo's pouch or a giant's pelic giant pelican's beak. It's got to be the pouch. You go pouch. You like to bounce around. Well, it's got to be a little more comfortable than the beak, <laughs> doesn't it? I would think. I this is not anything I've ever thought about. <laughs> but in front of hundreds of people, I've made you think about it. Yeah, yeah I'll be thinking about it all night. Yeah. I'm <laughs> It's been an honor to sit here on the stage with uh, a person who every time he was supposed to go to work, 
doesn't matter what he did for a living. He just happened to do it in front of 50,000 people a night. Showed up and said, I'm ready. He was baseball's Iron Man. He was a first time, first ballot Hall of Famer, a world champion, and a hell of a role model. Thank you. Cal Ripken.